Hey everyone, my name is Jay. Thank you so much for being here. On behalf of the entire church, we are happy to have you. We believe that everyone is welcome. So whether you're here in Bellevue or online, you are part of the BCC family. Speaking of everyone is welcome, hey new guests, we are thrilled that you are with us today. We hope that you're enjoying your experience so far, and if you're new today or maybe this is your third time and you're ready to get connected, fill out a connect card that you'll find in between your seats, or you can text hello to 402-207-5604. This will let us know that you're interested in seeing all that BCC has to offer. For our online guests, head to bellevuechristian.com forward slash connect and fill out an online card. We want to get to know you and welcome you into the family. I want to share with you our Church Center app. This app has amazing tools and helps you stay connected to BCC. You'll easily find things like ways to give, registration for our kids' life groups, church retreats and conferences, outreach projects, and more. We also have a connect button for you. Using the connect button, you can find our prayer request form, opportunities to serve, ways for you to share your testimony, and so much more. Also within our app, we have easy ways to sign up for life groups. Once you click on the life groups icon, you can search all the groups that we have. You can view the days that they meet, locations, and see what type of group that it is. We have men's groups, women's groups, young adult groups, serve groups, and more. If you're thinking an app isn't quite my style, simply go to bellevuechristian.com forward slash life groups. From there, you can read more about life groups and hopefully get some of your questions answered. You can find the link to sign up for a group and even become a life group leader right on this page. We hope that you join a life group today because we believe that everyone is welcome. middle schoolers or high schoolers, we have exciting opportunities for our kids to get involved with BCC. First, our BCC kids meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. downstairs. Kids, if you're new, head on down and ask for Miss Michelle, our next-gen pastor. She's so wonderful and would love to meet you and give you a special friend to hold on tight to. Also for our kids, Wednesday night is their own life group night. Every few months, the life groups change with cool new themes, so be sure to check out bellevuechristian.com forward slash BCC kids to sign up for a kids life group. Don't think I forgot about our youth. On Sundays, our sixth to eighth graders meet with members of our youth team to hear messages that are specific for them. On Wednesday nights, our sixth through 12th graders meet at BCC for worship and a message. We want to walk through life with you and help you navigate this ever-changing culture. I hope to see you at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. Are you looking for ways to serve your BCC family? Online, you can find opportunities by visiting bellevuechristian.com forward slash serve. Each serve team is unique in their own way and allows you to best use the gifts and talents that God has given you. Click on the drop down arrow to learn more about each group. When you're ready to take that next step, fill out our serve team form. This is a great step in getting connected. Members of our team will be able to find the best fit for you. We believe that saved people serve people. So sign up today to become a part of our Serve Team family. We can't wait to celebrate Jesus with you. Now let's get ready to worship.
fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Yes, I do. Still the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. my testimony from dead to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony Sons and daughters, I'm in blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, son and daughter. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from dead to life. Grace rewrote my story, I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified This is my testimony, this is my testimony If I'm not dead, you're not done, no, greater things are still to come, oh, I believe, if I'm not dead, you're not done, you're not, greater things are still to come, oh, I believe, if I'm not dead, you're not done, greater things are still to come. my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Amen. God's presence 
It's our first pursuit. So if you're hungry, if you need more from the Lord today, come on, somebody step out of your chair. Join us around the front. Or if you just want to worship where you're at, God can move in your seat too. Amen? But can we just lift our hands all across the room? God is in this room today. Come on, church family. God, we just lift our voices. God, we celebrate your presence. God, we thank you that you're here today. And God, our desire, our hunger, God, is to meet with you. To declare that you're worthy of it all. So this morning, God, hear us. Hear our prayer. Hear our worship today. God, we're here to honor you. We're here to celebrate you. Come on, just do that for a moment. Tell him he's holy. God, you're worthy, Lord, of all my praise. You're worthy, Lord. Come on, just a moment longer. Just in your own way. Just in your own words. God, my heart is open, Lord, to you this morning. You can do what you want to do. I'll worship you, Jesus. Worship you alone, Lord. God, we give this morning to you. It's in your name. Come on, somebody shout amen this morning. Amen.
Just rest in his presence this morning. Throughout this week, if you haven't stopped, if you haven't just paused, just to tell him thank you. Just to honor him for what he's done. Can we just do this, church? Can we lift our hands all around this room? Something powerful when a church comes together, unified with one spirit, with one heart, with one attitude. This morning, I don't want to fall short of giving our God the very best thanks we can give him. So just with surrendered hearts and humility, can you just tell him thank you? In your own words. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. No one like you, Lord. No one like you, God, thank you that you see past my faults. God, that even my brokenness God, you gave me a purpose. You gave me a new name. God, thank you in my brokenness. God, you washed away all the guilt and all the shame. God, that you took my burden. God, and you carried me. God, even though there's mountains, God, even though there's valleys to walk through, God, I'll never find myself alone. God, we just thank you for your presence. So good to me. And God, I can't believe how you love me. What a friend you have been. So good. So good to me. And God, I can't believe how you love me. What a friend. 
What a friend you've been, Lord. Oh, never had a friend like you, Jesus. Never known one like you. Oh, caught up in your presence. I just want to see. Just go through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sing another song. Take me back to where we start. I open up my heart to you, Lord. And I'm sorry when I come. With my agenda, I'm sorry, Lord, when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we start. I open up my heart to you, Lord. Present, oh, I just want. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you, Lord. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just 
presence, Lord. I just want to see at your feet. Put up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh, oh I'm not here for blessings. Oh, no. Jesus. All I need is you. All I need is you, Lord. Is you, Lord. All I need is you. One more time. All I need is you. Church, in this very moment, all we need is more of Jesus. All we need is more and more and more and more and more of Jesus. Some of us have tried it our way. Nothing's worked. But this morning, we declare in our hearts that all we need is you, Lord. Lord, you're enough. You're enough. You are enough for us. Father, you died on Calvary's cross that your children might have a right to eternal life. And we're grateful, Lord God. We're grateful. We're grateful. We're grateful. And so, Father, all the distractions, we come against anything that would hinder us in this very moment. Because the cry of our heart, God, is we just want more of you your word tells us if we hunger and thirst for you that you would fill us and so this morning God our hearts cry is fill us up Lord God fill us Lord fill us up Lord God we want more and more and more of you so right where you are Make that your personal song this morning. Just tell him in your own way, Lord, I want more of you. If you ask, he'll give it to you. Lord, I want more of you. If you ask, he will give it. And Father, we just thank you this morning, Lord God, that you are here to meet our very cry. All we want, Lord God, 
is more of you. So we thank you for your presence. <laughs> Church, there is nothing like the presence of God. Nothing like the presence of God. And as we are in this place and in this hour, we say, Lord, we thank you for all that you've done and all that you're yet going to do. And so would you do me just this big favor? Would you give the Lord a round of applause and let him know that you love him, you appreciate him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We love you, we love you, we love and we adore you. Now, we're still going to stay in this place of worship and we're going to take communion as a church family. And if you don't have an emblem, just raise your hand and the prayer team will bring you an emblem. I don't know about you, but last week we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we get to take part again, remembering what the Lord has done for us. And what I want us to know right now, in this moment, this sacred moment, is that we have an opportunity to let the Lord know how much we appreciate all the things that he has done for us. As we reflect on the things that he did for us on Calvary's cross, the way that he died, the way that he loved you and the way that he loved me, I'm grateful for that. And as I reflect upon that, I stand in awe of him. Church family, as we get ready to honor the Lord, not only are we going to reflect on what he's done, but we're gonna take these next few minutes and we're gonna ask the Lord, Lord, if I have done anything in the, your sight that's not pleasing, I'm gonna ask you to forgive me. See, communion was when the Lord had those at the supper table and it was an intimate moment. And this is an intimate moment for you and for I. If we've said anything, if we've done anything, husbands, wives, children, if you said anything to your parents, if you have an offense against someone right now and you know that you have it, if there's any kind of anger or malice, this is the time when you just say, Lord, please forgive me. Before I take part in this communion, I want to stand before you. David said, I want a clean heart. And that's what we're asking God to do right now. In your presence, Lord God, we're asking you to forgive us for anything that we've said, anything that we've done, Lord God, that's not pleasing in your sight. We ask you to blood wash us and purify us. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, take this in remembrance of me. So if you can take your emblem and take the, the, the wafer, we're going to partake of this together. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the wafer. Thank you, Lord, for your body. Father, we thank you for your body. We thank you for your body, God. And then you told us to take the cup the living but your blood, Lord God. And as we do this in remembrance, we remember the new covenant that you have with us. And so as we partake of the blood, let's remember that the blood that Jesus shed was for you and it was for I. So take your emblem and let's partake of the blood. Thank you, Lord God, for the blood that was shed for us. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for that blood, Lord God, that was shed for us. And you told us, as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of you. And church family, we can rejoice because of what God has done. We can rejoice because he lives. And because he lives,
lives, we have the very power of the resurrection in Jesus Christ. You can, de you can declare your healing in Jesus' name. You can declare the promises of God because he is alive. Come on, come on. We serve a risen Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to commemorate you, Lord God, and we give you glory for all the great things you've done for us. Now, amen, hallelujah. Now, turn to your neighbor and say, thank you for being at church today. I am so glad to see you. Thank you for being here. If you are watching online, we just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for watching with us. We love and appreciate that you are a part of us. God bless you. God bless you. Good morning, good morning, good morning as you are greeting one another. It's so good to see you this first Sunday in April. It's good to see you. If this is your first time here with us, we are glad that you chose to worship here at Bellevue Christian Center. There is a connect card in between your seat, and we would like for you to fill that out so that we can get to know you. Amen. Now, in continuing in worship, I'm going to ask the welcome team to come forward. And we are going to participate in this part of worship with our tithes and our offering. Amen. 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 As our welcome team comes forward, I am so glad that we are a church that abides by the word of God. I'm so glad that we are a church that gives our tithes and our offerings. The word tells us to give of our first fruits and God will bless us. As I have had an opportunity to be a tithe payer for many years, there have been times when I thought, well, maybe not, but I know what the word of God said and it's true. And every time I've been faithful to God, he's been faithful to me. And we want to thank each and every one of you that have been faithful, faithful, faithful to give your tithes and offerings to Bellevue Christian Center. It allows us to be a blessing not only in this church but in our community. We had a marvelous time last Saturday when we went out and did our, and did our Easter egg scramble. We're able, amen, we're able to bless and be amongst those in our community as we give our tithes and our offerings. And God loves, loves, loves a cheerful giver. Amen. So there are two ways that you can give through our church app on, online and also as um, we have our giving stations in the back. So go ahead and you can play pass the baskets. Father, we just want to pray over this offering real quick. We thank you, Lord God, for the givers, the Lord, those that are being a blessing to Bellevue Christian Center. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you will bless them in return in the matchless name of Jesus. You know, there are so many good things here happening at Bellevue Christian Center. So now we want you to find out what's happening now. Amanda, and welcome to Bellevue Christian Center. First, we want to welcome our first-time guests. We hope you're enjoying your experience so far. If you're new today, or maybe you've decided to make BCC your church home, and you'd like to get more connected, text hello to 402-207-5604. This will let us know that you're interested in seeing all that BCC has to offer. We want to get to know you and welcome you into the family. In between your seats, there are connect cards and prayer cards. If you didn't get a chance to place these in the giving plates, drop them off in the giving stations or you can bring them to the prayer room. Every day, our facilities team does an amazing job at keeping our church beautiful. But as we all know, sometimes there's projects around the house where you need to call in the reinforcements. This Saturday on April 13th, we are having a church-wide cleanup day. This truly is a fun day, especially for those of us who love projects. 
We'll have various tasks, including cleaning up our church grounds, organizing, moving furniture, and more. Oh, and this day is for the whole family. If you're interested in helping with our church-wide cleanup day, visit your Church Center app to sign up. We are for life change, and we look forward to every opportunity we get to celebrate what God is doing in each of our lives. Next week on Sunday, April 14th, we have the opportunity to celebrate baptisms. If you've recently given your life to God, or you'd like to rededicate your life to Him, we would encourage you to consider signing up. This is an opportunity to share with your BC Sweet family how God is working in your life and for us to celebrate your journey and encourage you. Sign up online or on your Church Center app. At the end of this month on April 28th, we are having our annual members meeting. During this meeting, members will speak into the future direction of the church by voting for the new church board members. We'll also hear about the great things God did in 2023 through our various ministries and share in the excitement for all God will do this upcoming year. Members, be on the lookout for an email next week with more details. Again, I'm Amanda, and there are three ways you can find out what's happening around BCC. Check out our website, follow us at bellevuechristian.ne, or you can stay up to date on your Church Center app. We believe the Bible changes how we live, so let's explore what God has for us today. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good, good. Well, I'm going to do this. I, in a few moments, we're going to pray that God will speak to us through the word, but I'm going to pray right now because I don't know if you've noticed it. It might just be the way that my brain works, but there's been more than one moment already this morning that my brain has had a hard time focusing. I don't know if anybody else is that way, but for me, I've seen a lot of things happening that I'm like, okay, where, what is happening this morning? So I'm just going to pray that over the next couple of minutes, all of us will be able to focus in, to open our hearts and our minds to what God would want to speak to us. And so if you are with me, could you just bow your heads and let's pray. God, I just ask that in this moment, you would remove any and all distractions. God, I pray that even the things that might try to steal our focus away from you this morning, I pray that, that we would have a resolve to say, no, I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus today. God, I pray that over these next few minutes as I share from your word, God, I, I just pray that you would speak to my heart, that you, would, that you would speak through me, Lord, that it would be you challenging us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I want to welcome all of you, both online and in person. Thank you for being here. If this is your very first time with us, or maybe you're new within the last few weeks or within the last month or so, right after this service out in our cafe, we have what's called Meet the Pastors. And it's an opportunity for you and I to get to know each other, for our pastoral team to introduce ourselves, just to get uh, a little bit of time, just a few minutes, just to hang out, get connected. We value connection at Bellevue Christian Center because we know that a church that's connected can make what seems like a big church feel small again. We believe that everyone is welcome at this place and one of the best ways for us to welcome one another is to get to know one another. So we would love to meet you right after service in our cafe for Meet the Pastors. Well, this morning we're kicking off a brand new series. This is week one of a series, and I'm going to scare somebody for just a minute. This series we're kicking off today is going to last until December. Now, some of the room is excited and like, yes, let's do it. And some of the room is like, what are we going to talk about from now until December? Well, the series that we're going to 
dive into today is titled, The Gospel According to John. The Gospel According to John. And over the next few months, what we're going to be doing is diving into the book of John that's found in the New Testament. It's one of four gospels. Gospel just means good news. It's, it's an account of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to spend time digging into this thing and getting to know who Jesus is. So I want to say this, that if you're in this place or you're watching online, and you're not sure about this whole God thing yet, you're not so sure about who Jesus is, you're, maybe there's a little bit of interest, or maybe you just showed up here this morning because someone drug you to church, and you're here just saying, I, I don't know about this stuff, this isn't for me yet, can I just encourage you, maybe challenge you and invite you to dive into this series with us, because through this series, you're going to get an opportunity to discover who Jesus is for yourself. Maybe you're in this place. You've been studying the Bible longer than I've been alive. You know the word inside and out. This will not be your first, fourth, eighth, 20th time going through the book of John. Can I just encourage you that there's more that God wants to speak to you? that you could spend a lifetime studying the word of God and never reach the bottom, never experience the full depths of what he has for you in his word, that even the pages that you've already read, God wants to speak something new, or maybe this morning he wants to bring back something old, that he spoke to you long ago, that he wants to remind you of and stir your heart with. We're diving into the gospel according to John. Who was John? Why did he write a book of the Bible? Why are we studying a book written by this guy named John? And honestly, is he... John the Baptist, is he this other John? How many Johns are there in the Bible? We're diving into this book written by one of the 12 original disciples. One of the sons of Zebedee, a son of thunder. Wherever my dad is, I, I love you, dad, but why couldn't we have been like, why couldn't I have been a son of thunder? It doesn't, it, it has a little bit different ring to be the son of Melvin. <laughs> My dad is so patient with me. He, he has let me make fun of him for years and years. John is just one eyewitness account. John writes from a unique perspective. You know, this whole idea kind of reminds me of a story I heard about a man who was telling about how he met his wife. To one person, he explained that my wife and I met in an attic, which immediately caused some concerns. What? To another, to another person, he explained that he and his wife had met sitting on a couch. To yet another person, he explained that my wife and I met while we were attending a Bible study. Now, at first glance, it seems like three conflicting stories, but truth be told, all of them are true at the same time. That he and his wife were attending a Bible study that was up in the attic of a house and sitting on a couch, they were introduced to one another. Same story, three different vantage points different perspectives. And in the Bible, you get these four gospels, these accounts of good news, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, telling the same story of Jesus, the Son of God, come to the earth to rescue us from four different vantage points and perspectives. Stories that complement one another, 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John deal a lot with what Jesus did. Did I just say all four of them? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Three. Matthew, Mark, and Luke deal with what Jesus did. John, as we see while we piece through this, focuses on why Jesus did what he did. On the meaning behind what Jesus did. So I want to begin this series with a question. And hopefully you got one of these notebooks on your way in. If you didn't, you're in luck because we've got plenty and you can grab one on your way out. But I would encourage you to be taking notes in these things. And I would begin in this notebook with this question because over the next few months, this is going to be the question that you and I are gonna seek to answer for ourselves. Who do you believe Jesus to be? Who do you believe Jesus to be? Do you hear that name, Jesus? Do you think of a prophet? Maybe a really good man. Maybe you think he was a great teacher. Maybe you've heard the name Jesus and thought he's just another myth or a legend. Is he the son of God? Is he your savior? Was he just some political revolutionary? Maybe as you think of Jesus, you put him in the same category as being a conservative or a liberal. Who is this Jesus to you? Why does this question matter? Because what we believe about who Jesus is will ultimately shape the way we live our lives. If Jesus is just another man, then why do I need to follow his way? But on the flip side, if Jesus really is all that he says he is, then how can I follow any other way? I love what A.W. Tozer said. He, he said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So who is Jesus to you? What belief do you hold? What formed your belief about Jesus? For some in this room, you've grown up attending church your whole life. You've heard all the stories of Jesus. You grew up in a home where the Bible was readily available, where you read through it together as a family, where your upbringing shaped this view of Jesus as your Savior, your Lord, your Rescuer. Others, maybe you didn't grow up in a home like that. Maybe this is the very first time you've ever walked into a church building. And this idea of who Jesus is, is kind of this compilation of what your friends say, coworkers, what the news says, what social media displays. For others still, our view of who Jesus is has been shaped and molded through the lens of our pain people who have hurt us, who called themselves Christian. Organizations that we've seen falter and fail that called themselves church. And because of that pain and that struggle, our view of who Jesus is may be a little bit skewed. So who is he? How do we find an accurate view of this Jesus? See, John, the author of the book that we're going to piece through, 
wasn't somebody who relied on secondhand knowledge of who Jesus was. He didn't just read storybooks and come to his conclusion. He was an eyewitness. Somebody who actually got to walk and talk with Jesus. Someone who listened intently as Jesus spoke and he heard not just his words, but can you imagine what Jesus' voice sounded like? John knew his voice. It was John who got to lean himself up against the savior of the world to find himself shoulder to shoulder with love itself. John writes not from what he's heard of, but what he's seen what he knows, what he watched happen, the healings, the miracles, the demons cast out. John was a witness. And through that witness and the power of the Holy Spirit, he began to write, this is what I know of who Jesus is. This morning, we're going to read in John chapter one, starting in verse one, and we're gonna look at the first 18 verses of this book. The first 18 verses, it's known as the prologue. It's the setup to everything that will follow. In fact, it is the thesis statement. And everything after those first 18 verses are pages filled with evidence pointing to what he just claimed. So these first 18 verses are powerful, they're important. If you're someone who lives for theology and deep doctrinal truths, it's got tons of it. If you're someone who comes alive more with poetic phrases and and beautiful imagery, it's rich with it. I love the way that John writes because half the time I find myself lost in just picturing what he's saying. And yet it's anchored in foundational truths that you and I can stand firm on. So if you have your Bibles or device that you can pull up John chapter one in, I wanna invite you to turn there. And as you turn there or pull it up, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to us through these pages. Here's a study tool for you. As you dive into the scriptures for yourself, pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to read the word with you. Ask him to reveal things to you. God, we ask that in these next couple of minutes, would your word come alive to us? Holy Spirit, would you bring revelation? Would you stir our hearts? Would you challenge us, convict us, teach us? God, we believe that your word is living and active. We believe that it's God breathed, Holy Spirit inspired, and that it's useful in every situation. Would you change us through your word today? In Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Side note, not the same John. Two different Johns. We'll get into who this John is in the coming weeks. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about 
the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. John makes all sorts of declarations in these 18 verses about who Jesus is. The first thing that we see John saying about Jesus is that Jesus is eternal and infinite. You look at those first three verses, in the beginning was the word. That means that before anything was made, Jesus was. Now we can wrestle with that, maybe it's easy to accept, but if you think about hearing this for the first time, perhaps you were in a place where you saw Jesus in the crowd, you heard him teaching, you watched him die, maybe you heard about his birth in Bethlehem. And suddenly you're hearing that Jesus did not have a beginning that he has always existed before Mary, before the manger, Jesus was. These first couple of words, this phrase in the beginning would have immediately brought these echoes of Genesis. The creation story. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God. John 1.1 says, in the beginning, God was the word, Jesus. He's eternal and infinite. Why does this matter? Think about this, what you believe about the beginning, his eternal existence will shape what you believe about the end. Now I know there's been all kinds of things said about solar eclipses and what that means for our world and I'm not gonna get into that. I am gonna say this, that if I believe that Jesus is eternal, that he had no beginning, he was there from the start and he has no end, then bring on the solar eclipse. Because Jesus is still Jesus that he's still going to be all that he said he would be. I love these words that John puts together because he wasn't just poetically penning the perfect word picture. He's making this bold theological claim that Jesus was not created by anyone. That Jesus is creator. That Jesus was both present for and participated in creation itself. See, there's never been a time or a place in which Jesus was not present. I wonder, have you ever in your life had this question, God, where are you? 
Have you ever gone through something? Something so hard, so painful, so confusing that it's left you feeling as though there's no way God could be in this. That somehow, some way in your life, there was this blip in time in which God ceased to be God. I know I've had those moments. Those moments in my life where I've wondered, God, where are you? God, I can't find you. God, I saw you in this part of my life, but it seems like in this part, you're absent. What John is saying is that there's never been a moment in which Jesus wasn't there. That even when you and I were unaware of his existence, unaware of his working, unaware of his movement, he still was. Maybe you're watching this service from a hospital bed right now. Saying, God, where are you now? Jesus, I don't feel your presence. I don't see you moving. Can I encourage you that Jesus is eternal and infinite. He's always, always been there and will always be. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And here's the second thing that John takes us to, and the word was God. Jesus is God. You say, wait a minute. Isn't there God the Father, and there's God the Son, and and there's the Holy Spirit? It seems like there's these three different personalities or individuals wrapped up in this thing. And, and the scripture teaches us, not just in John, but through many different places, that we have these three personhoods, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they're all one substance. Together, they're all one. The one true God. Jesus is the personified word of God. John in this moment is taking on philosophers and other polytheistic beliefs and he's meeting them head on. Jesus is not just some Greek mythology in which there's greater gods and lesser gods. Jesus is God himself. He's making this claim that Jesus is more than just some moral teacher or good example for us to follow but that he is God. And that through him, all things have been made, that there is nothing created that hasn't been made through him. C.S. Lewis says this, he says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Either he is or he isn't. 
What amazes me is that my belief about whether he is or isn't doesn't change that he is. It doesn't impact who he is. And yet the choice is yours. Either you will accept that Jesus is God or you will not. But there is no middle ground. If he is who he says he is, then what he says should mean something to me. If he is God himself, then I can't just dismiss all that he commands and all that he teaches. If he is God, then how can I not surrender my life to him, obey all that he commands, and live according to his way and not my own? Either he is God in my life or he is not. Next, we see John explaining to us that Jesus is life and light. That he is life and light. John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 said, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and darkness has not overcome it. When I was a kid, I was terrified of the dark. I'm not talking about the same kind of fear that most children go through where they don't like the dark. I'm talking about being horrified anytime the lights went out. At night, when it was time to go to bed, I was plagued with nightmares. I remember this season of my life where I could not go to sleep unless the lights were on. And night in and night out, my parents would tuck me in, they'd turn off the lights, I would wait till they would leave, and immediately I would get out of bed and turn the light on. Because as long as the lights were off, my imagination would run wild, and there were all kinds of things I just knew were creeping up closer to me in the darkness. Being a parent now, I understand what my dad's approach was, but at the time I said, dad, you just don't understand. You don't get what's going on here. Because my dad's response was, Andy, whatever it is that you're afraid of, it can't see you in the dark, so turn the lights off. In my head, I kept thinking, Dad, you, you don't understand. These things only come out in the dark. <laughs> I had this deep fear of the darkness because I knew somehow that bad things live in the dark. I knew that evil loves the dark, that the devil operates in the shadows. That the devil loves to move in the places where things are hidden. That from the beginning, from the fall of man, when the first sin entered the world, it brought with it darkness and death. But what John is saying is that when Jesus came, When he began to walk this earth, he is life and light and the darkness couldn't overcome it and death could not defeat it. That Jesus in himself, the source of life and light pushes back the darkness. Our world can feel so dark sometimes. Any parent in the room, it doesn't take long 
to find stories on social media or on the news of the horrific things that are happening day in and day out that cause you to look at your kids and, and, and be fearful of what could happen to them. Because we know that the world is dark. But if I believe that Jesus, like John said, is life and light, my fear begins to melt away because I know that there's nothing that can overcome all that Jesus is. No matter how dark our world may get, Jesus is the light that cannot be overcome. Not only is Jesus life and light, John tells us that Jesus was sent and rejected. Verses 9, 10, and 11 says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world. The world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not know receive him. We're talking about this passage together as a staff earlier this week, and I love the way that Pastor Richard phrased this. He, he talked about how Jesus coming into the world essentially was God putting his money where his mouth is. It was God deciding, I'm not just going to talk about it, I'm going to be about it. It was God saying, I don't just tell you that I love you, I send my son to get you. It was action. It was redemption in motion. Jesus sent to a sinful world to save lost ones like me, lost ones like you. Jesus was sent into the world that he helped create, into a world that he spoke into existence, and when he got here, we didn't recognize him. Not only did we didn't recognize him, we also rejected him. We don't know you, we don't want you. You ever walked into a place where someone should recognize you? They act like they don't know you. You feel this rejection, that's what Jesus went through. He was sent and he was rejected. I love that the story doesn't end there. That there was an option and there still is a choice to be made. You can either reject him or you can receive him. See, Jesus is the only way into God's family. And John tells us that for all who received him, he gave them the right to become children of God to enter into this royal, godly family, to have a place where you're cared for and you're loved, where you belong. John uses some of this legal language to give us this understanding of what we receive when we receive him. We live in a world that's convinced that there's multiple ways to find inner peace, happiness, spirituality, to find fulfillment. Take whatever path you'd like. And yet 
John, the eyewitness, the one who walked and talked with Jesus, is saying, no, there's only one way. There's only one way into life and life more abundantly. You will not just wander your way through multiple paths and eventually find yourself enjoying eternal life with Jesus. It's through Jesus alone. Jesus is the only way. Next, John tells us in verse 14 that Jesus was fully God and fully man. Fully God and fully man. And some of these things we're going to dive deeper into as we move through this series. So I'm just going to skim a little bit. Jesus, when he came to this earth, didn't lose a part of who he is. He didn't suddenly become less God as he took on human flesh. He was always fully God. But at the same time, he became fully human. Needing food and water like you and I. Needing sleep. Laughing with his friends, crying over loss experiencing anger over injustice, being tempted in every possible way, and yet never sinning. The only perfect person to ever walk the earth. Do me a favor, look around the room for just a moment. Introverts, I'm not going to make you introduce yourself to anyone. We're just going to keep our distance and look at one another. Don't gaze too long into anyone's eyes. That makes it weird. As we look around this room, there's not a single perfect person here. Not one. Pick the person you respect the most in this room. The person who you think is right there next to God, like they are on a godliness level that you may never attain. Still not perfect. And yet Jesus, who faced every temptation that I have faced, remained perfect. You say, well, that's because you just said he was fully God also. Can you imagine how challenging it would be to just put yourself in those shoes, to have all of the power and the majesty and the greatness, all that God is bound within your body, face temptation and decide, I'm not going to go God on them right now. The next time that you're in traffic and someone cuts you off and you want to say something or do something, think Jesus had this temptation and he didn't say or do any of the things that I'm about to say or do. That with all of his God self, he could have said, you're done. And he didn't. This is an Andy opinion, so separate this however you need to, all right? Whatever category this needs to go into, this is Andy's opinion. In my estimation, I believe it would be harder to be Jesus and be fully God and fully man and deal with temptation accordingly than to just be me and my human self and try to navigate it. You say, well, why, why would that be? Because I just said there's so much that I know I would use 
incorrectly. And yet God in his perfection I will not misuse my power, my authority. I will only lower myself and serve and accomplish the will of the Father. He was fully God, fully man. Verse 14 also tells us that Jesus is full of grace and truth. This is my favorite description of who Jesus is. Full of grace and truth. Jesus has never compromised truth. He has never bent the truth or or maybe faltered here or there and fudged the lines. Jesus is always, always 100% truth. There is nothing hidden from him. There is no thing about me that he doesn't know. He knows my deepest, darkest secrets. He knows all the things that others don't know. And yet, he's also full of grace. In his knowledge of who I am, I find myself both fully known and fully loved. Full of grace and truth. The truth that when we know it, it sets us free. Full of truth, full of grace, you and I are saved by grace through faith. Jesus has all of it. He knows everything about you and he loves you fully. He constantly pours out onto us more than we could ever deserve. Finally, who is Jesus? Jesus is the one who reveals to us the character of God. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come. I want you to hear this statement that if you want to know God, you have to get to know Jesus. If you want to know God, you have to get to know Jesus. Verse 18 tells us that no one has seen God, no one understands him fully, and yet Jesus has made him known to us. You wanna grow in your relationship with God, go deeper with Jesus. You want to understand who God is? Study Jesus. I began this morning with a question. Who is Jesus to you? Who do you believe Jesus to be? We said that what we think about Jesus, what we believe about him shapes how we live. And then we listed out things that the Bible teaches us about who Jesus is. So in light of that, how does this change the way I live? If Jesus is eternal and infinite, then I will not worry because there's never been a place in time where he wasn't with me. If Jesus is God himself, then I will not fear because there's nothing too big for him to handle. If Jesus is light and life, then I will trust him. Even when the world seems dark, when my dreams seem dead and when my pain won't cease. If Jesus is the only way into God's family, then I will hope in him and follow his ways and not my own. I will trust that I cannot be good enough. I cannot earn his favor or rely on my own works, but all that I can do is receive him and believe in his name. 
if Jesus was fully God and fully man, then I will not despair because I know that Jesus understands everything that I'm going through. If Jesus is full of grace and truth, I will feel secure because I know that he knows every detail about my life, including my deepest, darkest secrets, and yet he still loves me and calls me his own. I know that in him, I am fully known and fully loved. If Jesus reveals the character of God, then I will study him. I will choose to be with him. I will change to become like him so that eventually and ultimately I can become one with him. Who is Jesus to you? I wanna invite you to continue on this journey with me as, he, as we examine his life. But I wanna speak for just a moment to those in the room who would say, I already believe that all of this is true about Jesus. I have relationship with him. I, I would call myself a Christian. I wanna ask you one more question. Is what you believe about Jesus consistent with how you live your life? If all of these things are true, are you living accordingly? Is there evidence in the way you walk out your day-to-day -day life that Jesus is eternal? That he's life and light, that he's the only way, that he is God himself? I think if many of us were honest, we would say, yeah, I, I want my life to be that way. But truth be told, I know there are some areas in my life that are inconsistent. Some places in which my belief about who Jesus really is doesn't line up with what I say, what I do, how I treat people. This morning, we're going to just take a few minutes and have an opportunity to respond. We're gonna open up these altars and it's gonna be an invitation for those of us who say, ah, there's some inconsistency. We're gonna come before God and just confess it. Just say, yeah, God, I, I see a place where things aren't lining up and I need you to change me. So I'm gonna invite everybody all across this place to just close your eyes for a second. Just to prepare your heart Holy Spirit is speaking right now. He's putting his hand on areas of our lives. And he's inviting you to come to spend a moment with Jesus. Confess your inconsistency. Receive his grace and forgiveness walk out of these doors different than the way you came in. If that's you and you know you need to find a moment at these altars, then I'm just gonna invite you to begin moving forward. Begin getting out of your seat and coming down front, spending a moment with Jesus. The worship team is going to begin to sing. It's a song that we sang during worship, nothing else. It's just us fixing our eyes on Jesus saying, you are what I need 
more than anything. God, you know our hearts, we're responding to your word. We wanna live like you are who you say you are. We fix our eyes on you this morning and we confess we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond. All I need is you, Lord. All I need is you, Lord. I surrender all to you, Lord. I surrender all to you, God. I set my heart on you, Lord. I set my heart on you, Lord. I just need you to move in me. I need you to move. I'm sorry when I just go through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sing another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart. Oh, I open up my heart to you, Lord. Because I'm sorry. Would I just come with my agenda? I'm sorry, Lord. When I forgot that you're enough, take me back to where it started. I open, open up my heart to you. Oh, I'm going to continue to leave these altars open and we're going to continue to worship together and I just want to invite you to stay as long as you need. I know the temptation can be as soon as somebody comes up here and says, okay, we're not going to officially dismiss and we're just going to hang out and is to say, okay, well, there it was, there's the time, but I want you to know that God is moving in this place. I believe that it's not finished quite yet. 
So we're not gonna have an official time in a few minutes where we shut things down and move on. We're just gonna leave it open. And when you gotta go, you gotta go, we understand. We're just gonna spend some time, some quality time in the presence of God this morning. If you're brand new, I look forward to seeing you at Meet the Pastors. It may take me a few minutes to get out there because I don't wanna miss what God's doing right now. Those of you that do have to leave, we look forward to seeing you next week. Let's just take a few more moments and worship together and respond to what God is doing. Let's continue to sing, nothing else.
Give you permission. 